Mahjong is a four-player Chinese tile game that took America by storm in the 1920s when Joseph Babcock, an American businessman, imported the game with simplified rules for Americans. He wrote a book called The Red Book. Babcock rules is very much like Cantonese style. It has chows, pungs, and kongs. The setup of the game and the mechanics of the game are the same. In the day, there were still variations being played. So a group of ladies in New York decided to standardize the rules and in 1935 established the National Mahjong League. This has become what we know as American Mahjong and the National Mahjong League is the flagship organization. There are other organizations that produce American Mahjong cards, namely the American Mahjong Association. Destination Mahjong has the next generation card. There's Marvelous Mahjong and then there is Siamese Mahjong by Gladys Grad of Mahjong Madness. There may be others out there. I believe there's a junior edition. So there are other American Mahjong variations. Some groups enjoy rules from the past so much that they decided to play these rules even today. And those have become known as house rules. There are new house rules that have been added to the community as of late. In this video, I'm going to talk about the most common house rules played today. The first one is a five player game. This particular way to play is actually in the guidebook written by the National Mahjong League called Mahjong Made Easy. I'll have a link below the video to where you can get that. It's just on their website in their store. When you play a five player game, the fifth player sits out and the game of four players are going to play. Whoever was the dealer, also known as East, will get up and that fifth player will take their place and they will play as an active player at that table. Then the next player who was East will get up and whoever was sitting out will sit in and the rotation occurs like that game after game. In some groups, whoever is the player sitting out will look at everybody's hand before the discard by East to start the game and they will decide who they think will win the game. There's usually some kind of an indicator. They'll pick who they think will win. And then they'll turn it upside down on the table. After the game, they reveal their choice. And if they're correct, they get paid just like the winner. That's how you play five. Two choices, sit out, make phone calls, go on a bio break, take a walk, or bet. The next option is a three player game. The league says to omit the Charleston when you play three. I think they think that it's too easy with the Charleston because there's only three of you. It's too easy to build your hand quickly. So I think they think it's too easy of a game. So they say to omit the Charleston. Some groups though, like the Charleston and they want to play with the Charleston. So they do. And there are a few ways that you can do this. Some are complicated and some make sense. Do what's comfortable for you. The way we do it is we set up a column of passes in front of the missing player from their wall. So we'll have six rows of three tiles each in front of the missing player's wall. Those are the incoming passes. Any pass that is going out of a player's hand goes into another column of tiles. We call that the outbound column. So there are going to be two columns eventually and throughout the process. The inbound column will 
become fewer and fewer where the outbound column will grow. So when you receive a pass from the missing player, you'll take the first row of tiles as your incoming pass and you'll put your tiles in the outbound column. So for that very first pass, there'll be one pass or one row of three tiles for the outbound column. And then there'll be five rows of three tiles each for the inbound column. So you'll have two columns and then you proceed through the Charleston at the end of the Charleston for the optional cross, whoever is sitting across from the missing player, they will get the tiles from the outbound column, basically all the tiles that were passed in the Charleston, and they'll mix those up and do an optional cross there. So it's important to do a player rotation when you're playing three with the Charleston, because then whoever is sitting across from the missing player will change because there is a little bit of a benefit to sitting across from that player, that missing player. So that's how you play three. The next house rule that I want to talk about is the pie. On the card, every hand has a value, points. You can play for points and just write the minus score for the players who pay into the winner and a positive score for the player who wins and keep track that way, paper and pencil, just track points. Another way you could do it though, is to play for money. Normally people use quarters, dimes and nickels. And many times they'll put a limit on how much you can lose. That's called a pie, P I E. Standard pies are, based on how long of a playing session you have. If you're playing for three hours, you might only have a $3 pie. If you're playing for four or more hours, maybe a $5 pie. If you're playing for six, 10, 12 hours or more, $10 pie is the way that I have played in certain groups. Also, if you want to play high stakes Mahjong, double the value on your card and raise the pie to $25, $30, $50, whatever you want to do. Big money. That's kind of fun to do once a year, like on New Year's Eve, have a high stakes game, double the value on the card. So that is how the pie works. Kind of a piggyback house rule with pie is the wall game kitty. Anytime there's a draw, so basically a wall game, each player at the table pitches a quarter into a kitty. So a little bowl on the table or a little, uh, just kind of somewhere separate where uh, you can put a quarter donation per player to uh, build up so that when there is a player who loses their pie, whoever wins gets paid from the kitty. So they get full payment. At the end of this session, you just divvy out any remaining money to each of the players. That's called a wall game kitty. The next house rule I want to share about is part of the Charleston. It's called a mush. During the Charleston, we do right across left. That's obligatory. First Charleston. Then we do the second Charleston, which is optional, left across right. Once you start it, you got to finish it. After you do the second Charleston, then you do an optional cross where you negotiate up to three tiles with the player across from you. That ends the Charleston, unless you're playing mush. If you're playing with mush, the players can do another optional Charleston pass. They take up to three tiles from their hand and put it in the middle. Anybody who wants to participate does the same. You mix the tiles up and however many you put in, you take out. So let's say I put two in. Other players put one, two or three in. We mush up the tiles and I take two out because I put two in. That's called a mush. The next house rule is a player rotation. This is actually a really good practice. Basically you play four games and then whoever was East switches places with the player on their right every four games. And that just keeps passing fresh. 
and playing the game fresh because everybody has a different style of play, different levels of strategic decision-making that affect passing and discarding. Maybe even when they switch to defense and break up their hand. If you have a player rotation, you can keep the game fresh and not any one player um, is hurt because they're sitting next to the same player or across from the same player just because of their idiosyncrasies or style of play or level of strategy and defense. The next house rule is called picking ahead. This was done years ago, but some groups still do it. Basically what happens is you pick your first pick and you put it in front of your rack or you put your finger on it in front of your rack. East discards, and then they pick a tile. And then they hold on to it. They don't look at it. They just hold it in front of their rack. They usually have their finger on it. And then the next player looks at their tile, and then they discard and pick. And then they hold it and wait. The next player looks at their tile. They discard and pick. And then they hold that tile. The next player looks at their tile, and then they discard and pick. That's picking ahead. The problem is if somebody claims a discard, those tiles that were picked ahead have to be put back. If they get put, out, put back out of order, it messes up the Zen of the game. It's very complicated. I'm sure some people have mastered the technique, but it's no longer supported by the National Mahjong League. There is a similar rule called playing with futures. This also was done years ago. It's called also a 14 tile game. You start with 14 tiles instead of 13. So East will have 15 tiles. They will discard leaving them with 14 tiles just like everybody else. Instead of picking first to start your turn, you discard then pick. So discard pick the next player's turn. They discard and pick the next player's turn. Discard and pick. If somebody claims a discard, turns can get skipped just like normal. If you draw your winning tile, you hold it for a round of discards. On your turn, you declare Mahjong. If somebody discards your winning tile, you declare Mahjong, discard, and add the winning tile to your hand to have your complete 14 tile valid hand. That is called playing with futures. Another house rule is called atomic. This for me is actually interesting and comfortable because the hands allowed in an atomic hand are borrowed from Cantonese style. They're hands that are not on the card. One option is seven unique pair. With seven unique pair, some groups allow flowers, some do not. So you'd have to find out what they allow for seven unique pair. Some groups also have four sets in a pair as an atomic hand. The sets can be three in a sequence or three of a kind, and flowers may or may not be allowed. Some groups say the four sets have to be all three of a kind. So there are even variations within atomic hands. So you just need to find out from the group you're playing with uh, what their rules are with atomic hands. When you play an atomic hand, you declare it from your drawn hand. And you cannot start with any flowers or jokers. If you have flowers or jokers, you do not qualify to play atomic for that hand. If you have no flowers or jokers, you can declare that you're playing an atomic hand. You put some kind of a indicator on your rack, whether it be a penny or a little figurine. Some people use domino tiles with stickers on them that say atomic. So you have that, that indicator on your rack so everybody knows you're playing atomic because they cannot pass you a flower. In some groups, they allow it. So again, you have to ask the rules for atomic for that particular group. During the pick and discard phase of the game, 
if you draw a flower or a joker, you are no longer atomic. You remove your indicator and say you're off atomic or no longer atomic, and you now have to change your hand and play something on the card, which is very difficult to do. The value of an atomic hand, if one, is usually 50 points. Some people might put a higher value on it. You just have to ask the people in your group. The next two house rules are similar and get confused all the time. The first one is called a hot wall. When you play Mahjong, we roll the dice and break the wall. Some groups just push out the wall and they don't roll the dice, but most groups do. It's in the rules. So you roll the dice, break the wall. The tiles to the left of the break are what we start the deal with. We curtsy it out so everyone can reach it and we start dealing the tiles. The tiles to the right of the break remain in front of East wall. Whatever number that is, depending on the number on the dice that were, was rolled, that becomes the hot wall. During the pick and discard phase of the game, you play normally until you get to the hot wall. Once you start picking and discarding from the hot wall, if you discard the tile, for a winning hand, you have to pay for the whole table. That's called a hot wall. The other variation is called cold wall. You roll the dice, break the wall. The tiles to the right of the break become the cold wall. You deal the tiles and play the game. When you get to the cold wall during the pick and discard phase of the game, if you discard the tile, there's no penalty. You just play normally, but nobody can win by discard during the cold wall. You have to draw your winning tile yourself. So it's not the discard that matters like in the hot wall where you pay double if you discard the winning tile during the hot wall. With the cold wall, you can discard anything you want, but anybody at the table can only win if they draw their winning tile themselves. That's the difference. If you have any questions about these common house rules, write them in the comment section below. And if you have any house rules that are played that I didn't mention here, write those in the comment section below. I'm collecting. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, consider subscribing. Click the bell if you do. That way you'll get notification for when I post new videos and you won't miss an opportunity to learn a new strategy or pick up an insight to the game that could give you an advantage at the table. Between now and the next variations video, may all your picks be keepers.